And we are now recording. After a while, the uh, light will come on, I hope. Knock on wood. But let's get up from the current slide. And let me go over just a couple of announcements. Uh, one I know for sure. One I've heard about and I assume is going to be true, but we'll get into that. Um, I guess first and foremost, kind of the good news, bad news situation, y'all get a double dose of this this week, okay? Uh, the bad news is there's no class on Thursday. Thursday's the 4th of July, national holiday, state holiday. The college is closed on Thursday. The good news is doesn't affect us any. We have class Monday and Wednesday, so we'll be both classes. And then the other bit of news, and this is something I've heard, but I haven't seen it officially, is that it may even be they're going to give us a half day off on Wednesday because the governor has said Friday, or this is what I've heard, was going to be a state holiday. She's going to give state employees a day off on Friday as well. And since we don't come to school on Friday, our administration thought, well, we ought to at least give them half a day off on Thursday, on, on Wednesday. So we'll, I, I, you know, don't miss a class. Find out today or check your emails or whatever and make sure that they are going to do that. But, uh, so it could be that we will only have class for half a day on Wednesday. But the good news of that is we'll still have our class on Wednesday morning. So, uh, even though the, afternoon classes may or may not be suspended. So we'll see what happens there. All right, any questions before we get started and where we left off last time? Okay, we're in 3.5. Chapter 3 is Applications Differentiation. 3.5 are Limit Set Infinity, which is sort of a contradiction, except now we're talking about as the variable is approaching infinity, what is the function doing? Later, they're going to talk about what happens as the variable approaches the thing and the limit is infinity. Well, that, to me, is a contradiction because if, if there's no limit, there's no limit. So don't say the limit's at infinity. But this way, we can go this route. Find the limit as x approaches infinity of 2x minus 1 over x plus 1. What was the little rule I gave you last time? It's not really necessary to look at a, uh, a limit or anything else. The, the deal to do is look at, and y'all had this, if you had pre-calculus algebra, hopefully you had it there, okay? You look at the ratio of the leading terms. What's the ratio of your leading terms here? Two. Two. That means the limit as x gets very, very large. Who cares if x is getting extraordinarily large, like 3 million, this will be 2 million, I mean, 6 million minus 1. What is that minus 1 contributing? Almost nothing, okay? And this would be, uh, what did I say, 2 million? Uh, no, 3 million. This would be 3 million plus 1. What is that contributing? Almost nothing. All the action as x gets very large is going on in the leading terms, okay? And the ratio there is 2, so when x gets very large positive, it's approaching 2. When it gets very large negative, it's approaching 2. So you're, uh, that's really all you have to do with these, okay? Um, now, we'll learn in time another test that we can do but we're not quite there yet. I think we'll get there fairly soon. But here's what they do. Note that both the numerator and the denominator are getting infinitely large as x goes to infinity. Of course they are, okay? So that doesn't tell you anything. Uh, that result is an indeterminate form to resolve, that, resolve the problem. And here's what we're really doing. Uh, it's the ratio of the leading term, but you can also do this. Divide both numerator and denominator by x. Now, why is that legal? Pretty hazardous to go around dividing by x in case x is zero. But guess what? x isn't zero. x is going to infinity. We're way away from zero. So we don't have to worry about that any. So you're dividing by 1 over x over 1 over x, or multiplying by that. And 1 over x times 1 over x, as long as x isn't zero, is one. You can multiply by one any 
anytime you want to. So that's what we're doing here. Now if you uh, simplify this, 2x over x is 2 minus 1 over x, well that's 1 over x. x over x is 1 plus 1 over x, that's 1 over x. So that's their next step. You can do all this, that's exactly what they get next. Now let x approach infinity. Where is 1 over x going when x is very, 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 very large? 1 over x is going close to? Yes. Give me a large number. Any large number. Make up 1. 5? Yeah. 1 over 5, that's 0. 0.2. Give me a larger number. 10? 1 over 10 is 0. 0.1. Give me a larger number. Again. 30, is that what you said? 1 over 30 is 0 0.0333, okay? So, what are you getting closer and closer to? We are still at pretty small numbers. 30 is not that big. Zero. You're getting closer and closer to 0. So, 1 over x is going to 0. Down here, 1 over x is going to 0. So, what do you left with? 2 over 1, which is 2. Which is the same thing as looking at the ratio of the same thing. This actually does it a little more maybe elegantly and you know, thoughtfully, but yeah, that's all you do. The ratio of leading numbers. Okay? And this gives us the limit. Oh, break it down further. Yes, why don't we? Um, this limit is 2 minus 0 over 1 plus 0. And that would be 2 over 1, which is Lots of steps to get there this way. Ratio of leading terms goes it much, much more quickly. But that's what you're doing. That justifies the ratio of leading terms. You do that when your x is getting extraordinarily large, positive or negative. Any questions on that? Okay. Now, so the line, this is the ratio. Let's go back to our beginning here. So you can remind yourself where you came from. Find the limit of this. So there's your function, okay? This function is your y. This is your f of x, and that's your y. So where is y heading on the graph? Heading to 2, okay? So here, at y is equal to 2, there's your horizontal asymptote. The function is approaching that from the upper side as x gets very large negatively. From the lower side as it approaches uh, that positively, uh, x is approaching infinity positively, but they're both going to 2. We call that line a horizontal asymptote. Now, this one also has a vertical asymptote. Where would that be? What can you never do? Divide by zero. Well, here's your denominator here, x plus one. When is that equal to zero? When x is equal to negative one. So that's your vertical asymptote. x equal to negative one, horizontal asymptote, y is equal to two, which you get a completely different way here. Now, here's another difference. Your function can never touch or cross a vertical asymptote. You cannot ever have x equal to negative one. Now, on a horizontal asymptote, yeah, it could have crossed it many times, touched it many times, but it's just that in the long run, the function's getting closer and closer to that vertical, horizontal asymptote. It can touch or cross a horizontal asymptote anywhere, it's just in the long run, it's getting closer and closer to it. Never touch a vertical asymptote. Okay? Any questions on that? All right. So, before we get to the guidelines, let's do example three. Okay? I have to check and make sure my, well, it's the first time I've written. I don't have my pen set up. Okay. All right. Example three. And by the way, on the uh, left-hand margin, there's a little blurb about Maria Gatana Agnesi. 
and pretty sure she was Italian. That is a very Italian sounding name. Uh, she it mentions University of Bologna, which is in Italy. Uh, so pretty sure that's where she was. Uh, she was one of a handful of women to receive credit for significant contributions to mathematics before the 20th century. And actually before well into the 20th century at that. Uh, but uh, in her early 20s, she wrote the first text that included differential and integral calculus, first one written, okay? By age 30, she was an honorary member of the faculty at University of Bologna. Probably honorary, because they probably were by law you know, not allowed to hire her because she was a woman, but she was an honorary member. And if you, uh, there's a nice little, you can write on her, her contributions, uh, and there's also a little blurb uh, thing there referencing an article, Why Women Succeed in Mathematics, uh, written by three women. Uh, so if you want to pursue that article, you can. Now there's a reason that's showing up here. There's a function coming up a little bit later that we will, uh, that Agnesi was responsible for. But let's do example three. And if you have a website, or I mean, you can go to the website, uh, see LarsonCalculus.com for an interactive version of this type of an example. So even if you don't have the book, you can follow what the reasoning is. So here we have the limit as x is approaching infinity, meaning getting very, very large, and this is positive infinity, by the way, of 2x plus 5 over 3x squared plus 1. Anyone uh, want, want to make a guess of where that might be going as that's because very, very, very large, infinitely large, positively? It'll be the same answer negatively too, but they're only doing x approaching positive infinity. Any ideas? What might you do? Anybody? Okay, pick the largest uh, power of, of your variable, and that would be x squared, and divide or multiply by 1 over that, however you want to say it. So it would be 2x over x squared plus 5 over x squared, I see no reason of taking two or three steps to do something that's going to wind up this, over 3x squared divided by x squared plus 1 divided by x squared. All right. Now, what does that first term in the numerator give you? I should have my limit in front of that, but you understand the limit goes... I'll just say we're only working with this for right now. That would be that one x will go out, and that leaves you two over x, right? Plus, no x would go out, five over x squared. Denominator, what do you get? Three plus one over x squared. Nothing divides away there. Okay, now what happens to this expression when x goes very, very large? What happens to 2 over x? Where is, where is it headed? 0. 5 over x squared? 0. 0 over 0? 0 plus 0? Zero. 0. Okay, down here? 3. And that goes to 0, so you have 0 over 3. Where is that going? Zero, yes. So this, of course, this limit is zero. And that's a perfectly legitimate limit. That means the horizontal axis, the x-axis, is also a horizontal asymptote. Okay? Function is going to approach that as x gets very, 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 very large. Now, it will be approaching it, doesn't matter all this, but from the top. Okay? 
uh, because you know, it'll be approaching from the top as x goes to positive infinity, because that certainly will be positive, and that is always positive, so yeah, it'll be approaching zero from there. On the negative side, however, this would be a, a negative number, okay? And this would be always positive, so this is coming up this way. Now, actually, that one does cross at x equal 5 halves, negative 5 halves, right? x equals negative 5 halves, this would be 2 times negative 5 halves would be negative 5 plus 5 is 0. So it would be 0 uh, there. So it does t cross the x-axis. Uh, x, yeah. It's positive before that, okay? And wherever it's coming from. And then it crosses there and then approaches that from there on. Okay. So it can cross the <coughs> horizontal asymptote. No problem there. Does this one have a vertical asymptote? What do you think? What would be required for a vertical asymptote? What can you never do? Divide by zero. The denominator would have to be zero. Is that denominator ever zero? Why not? Okay, because x squared is never negative. Could be zero, but never negative. Okay, three times zero would still be zero, but never negative. Okay, add one to it, never zero and never negative. Okay, so that one will never be zero. So there will be no vert uh, vertical asymptote. There will be a horizontal asymptote of y is equal to zero. Okay? So that was the first one of these. They don't show the graph, but the limit is zero. Let's do the second one. The limit as x approaches infinity of 2x squared plus 5 over 3x squared plus 1. Okay? Any guesses here? Two-thirds. How'd you do it? Yeah, ratio of leading terms will do it for you. Just look at that. The x's go out, and that's going to be two-thirds. Why is that legal? Because as x is very, very large positively, these terms over here have less and less importance. Uh, so basically, these dominate, and the ratio of those terms is two-thirds. Or we can do it as Patrick did on the last time, divide every term by x squared, and it gives you the same answer, two-thirds. Okay? And the book even got that good for them. Okay? Let's see what the third one is. The limit as x approaches infinity of 2x cubed plus 5 over 3x squared plus 1. They kept the denominator the same and just raise the power of your x in the numerator. Uh, 3x squared plus 1. Okay? What you reckon is going to happen there? Anybody? Where is that heading? Anyone? Pretty exciting stuff, huh? Where is that going? It, yeah, it's getting infinitely large. There is no limit, okay? Uh, it sort of bugs me that they say, okay, they finally conclude the limit does not exist. Does not exist. Why? Because the ratio of the leading terms here, or dividing everything by x cubed, will give you 2 in the numerator 
and 1 over x in the denominator. Uh, this is the denominator is going to 0. Can't happen. Cannot happen. Okay? So uh, this one will not exist. You have a numerator that's not 0, denominator that is. Or just look at the ratio of the leading terms. The x squares go out, and that leaves you 2x over 3. And guess what? As x is very, very large, 2x takes off, 3 never changes. Okay? So that's going to be, it just keeps increasing without bound. Now, does any, do any of you recognize what sort of a special case this is? I think we mentioned it at least once. Uh, but does anyone recognize it? This one has what we call a slant asymptote or an oblique asymptote. Anyone remember how you get it? Divide the numerator by the denominator. Okay. Divide this into that, and you'll come up with a linear term. Plot that linear term, that's your straight line, and then the function's going to approach that line both positively and negatively. Okay? Uh, so that will be an oblique asymptote. But it's still no limit as x goes to infinity because that straight line, which is going to have a slope of weird, but I think two thirds or something like that, but still, because it's approaching that line that has no limit, then it has no limit all as well. So you don't need to go into that. This one is one. Anytime the degree of the numerator is exactly one greater than the degree of the denominator, it will have an oblique or a slant asymptote. But they're not plotting it. We're not going to plot it. Okay. So let's move on to our guidelines. Here they are. The guidelines for finding limits at plus or minus infinity okay, of rational functions. If the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, then every time the limit's going to be zero. Why? Because your ratio of leading term is going to be basically 1 over x or 1 over x, or something over x to the first, or second, or 15th power, or whatever, that's always going to be zero. Okay? If the degree of the numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator, then the limit of the rational function is the ratio of the leading coefficients. Well, still, the ratio of the leading terms is just that if the degree of the numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator, then those x's divide, or whatever your variable divides out, and it just leaves you with the ratio of the leading coefficients. Okay? And if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, the limit does not exist. D and E does not exist. Because it can't. It can't possibly exist because you have x is left over in the numerator as they go to infinity, so does your function. Does not have a limit. So this is what I was saying all along, why they took you through all the limits. I guess they just love limits and wanted to use them, but this is uh, so much easier to do. Any questions? Now, the guidelines for finding limits that infinity of rational functions seems reasonable when you consider that for large variables of x, values of x, the highest power term of the rational function is the most influential in determining the limit. That's what I was talking about. Now, here's the one, the reason they mentioned uh, Miss Agnesi, okay? Agnesi, however you say her name. Here, this is a function that she investigated. Uh, now, one thing, this has no vertical asymptote because the denominator will never be zero. Okay, just like some of the other denominators we look like at. Okay? But the ratio of leading terms is what? 1 over x squared. And as x is very, very large, this is going to zero. The degree of the denominator greater than the degree of the numerator, so this uh, limit is zero. Okay? Uh, because the, the, the denominator overpowers the numerator as x increases or decreases without bound. So here is how this looks. If this was her function and the graph of the function that she considered and was studying, and because of a really stupid translation error, uh, I 
I can't remember what they called it originally. The something of a nation. Okay. But when they translated from either Latin to or, or, or Italian to Latin or Italian to quite some of the language, they mistranslated whatever they called this function in Italian and made the translation which. And someone would have certainly looked into that had that been a male's name following it. That wouldn't have been good. But with a female's name following no, no, let's call this the witch of the Ignacy, you know. And they sort of like making fun of her. I don't know what the deal was. But anyway, to this day, this is called the witch of the Ignacy. Has nothing to do with witches. Has nothing, you know, it was just a translation error. Okay. Uh, through a mistranslation of the Italian ver word vertilere, the curve has come to be known as the Witch of Ignacy. Okay? And she introduced it in that comprehensive calculus text that I was talking about. And this is Joy, is that right? Uh, no, Ashley. Ashley, Ashley, sorry about that. There you are. Okay. All right. Now, now, if you have functions that are rational functions, your horizontal asymptote will have a limit same left to right. Almost got to. Okay. Okay. Is that just very large positive or negative? It's going to be the same. However, if they're not rational functions, you can expect differences. Okay? And here's what we're going to do next. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I did the wrong one. This is the one. The function shown here is a special case of the type of curve studied by the Italian mathematician Maria Gatana Agnesi. Uh, the general form of the function, this is it, not the one I was pointing to. Uh, 8a cubed over x squared plus uh, 8a squared. And that's come to be known as the Witch of Ignacy, mostly from a really stupid mistranslation that no one ever bothered to correct. I guess they thought it was cute, so they kept calling it that. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, we're not going into that. That was her function. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong one. Okay. Now, as it's, this is what I was heading at before. For rational functions, whatever it's going to, for positive, uh, as x goes to positive infinity, got to go to the same thing for negative infinity. Okay? Now, that's when there is a limit. When there's not a limit, they can go in opposite directions, or same directions, it doesn't matter. But there's no limit on either one of them. This is always true of rational functions. Functions that are not rational, however, may approach different horizontal asymptotes to the right or left, or may not even be defined either on the right or the left. So you have to watch for that. And this is, example four shows a couple of these. A here is not a rational function. Okay? Now, how would you suppose that we're going to deal with this one? Any ideas? What Patrick suggested before is the thing the book suggests. And I will, oh, okay, sorry. I was looking at uh, this and saying, what's the difference here? The difference is where your limit is, okay. Uh, but let's do it that way, okay? Let's divide every term in numerator and denominator by x, okay? Now you might say, but hey, wait, 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 here's an x squared in the denominator. But that x squared is inside a square root. So the square root of x squared is x. So let's divide everything, numerator and denominator, by x. So this will be 3x over x 
minus 2 over x divided by, now be careful here, the square root of, I better do it in two steps, okay, maybe more than two, 2x two squared plus 1 divided by x, okay, now if I want to bring that x into the square root, then that's going to be an x squared, right? So then this becomes numerator, well, let's go on and do that. That's going to be 3 minus 2 over x, if I could write, divided by, now let's bring that into the square root, 2x squared over x squared plus 1 over x squared, okay? And this becomes, uh, as x goes to the positive infinity, second term disappears, it gives you a 3. And in the denominator, those disappear, and this gives you the square root of 2 plus, and what's 1 over x squared as x goes to positive infinity? 1 over x squared as x goes to positive infinity? Zero. It's going to 0. Okay, so this would be 3 over root 2. All right, now, as x is approaching negative infinity, you would do the same thing, but here, notice, x has now got to be a negative number. So this thing, as, as you let x go very, very negative, uh, that numerator will still be 3 over x minus 2 over x. That's the same. I mean, 3x over x minus 2 over x. And this will be the same thing. I'll just skip the middle step and do 2x squared over x squared plus 1 over x squared. Okay? The x's go out here. The x squareds go out here. Uh, Okay. Um, I said the x's go out here, and they really do. Uh, but this is a negative number, right? 3x, as x is a negative infinity, will be a negative number. Down here, though, the x squares are all inside your uh, radical. And they get squared anyway, so that's positive. This is positive, that's positive. So this thing is becoming a very, a, a number that's, uh, look back at this one. It's x is very large negatively. This is a very, very, very large negative number. This will be a very large positive number because number one, you squared it. And number two, you take it apart the principal square root of it. So the, the denominator is always uh, positive. The numerator is always negative. That means your ratio is going to be negative. This doesn't show it to me as much as this does. So uh, they carry this through. Uh, and here's what you have to do with it. Because x is going to infinity, what you're doing is... When you divide by x here, you're dividing by a negative number. When you divide by 1 over x squared here, you're dividing by a positive number. So you have to make that minus 1 over x squared, okay, which brings a minus out here. So it's really awkward. Think of it this way. As x is getting very, very large negatively, this is an extremely large negative number. This is an ex exceptionally large positive number, but it's the same degree. This is positive, so this will be negative 3 over positive root 2. And to me, that's the better way to look at it than having to introduce uh, negative 1 over x squared, uh, negative the square root of x squared. It's just rather bizarre, okay? Because when you're 
x is less than 0, we write x as minus the square root of x squared. That's what's required here. When x is negative, uh, x is equal to minus the square root of x squared. And that's what you've got to remember to do when you're multiplying this way. So the minus sign winds up here. I suggest do it up here. Just look at this and say that's going to be a very large, or this one, I'm sorry, very large negative number. This is a very large positive number. So it's going to be a minus 3 over root 2. They did it the other way, and 3 over negative root 2 gives you the same answer. Okay. Now, I think they show the graph of that one. So let's see if they show it. Oh. Let me erase all my scratch. And you can see how they did it, so I don't have to do it again. Uh, for x greater than 0, x is equal to the square root of x squared. So when you uh, divide this by x and this by square root of x squared, those are the same things. x is square root of x squared. When x is positive, okay, uh, then incorporate it, and that gives you 3x over x, which is 3, minus 2 over x, which is going to 0, okay, over the square root of uh, 2x squared over x squared plus 1 over x squared, and that would be the square root of 2 plus 0, and that would be 3 over 3 plus minus 0 over the square root of 2 plus 0, and that's going to be Goodness gracious, what did they do here? They went back to here. Oh, I see. They didn't have the limits in here, so now they write the limits in here. So they wrote it in here, and they wrote it in that last term. Okay. I was already assuming they were doing that, and that gives you 3 over root 2. Ah, Ryan's here. All right, anyone else come in since the call roll? I don't want to leave, but hopefully we'll be back. Okay, so that gave you 3 over square root of 2, which is exactly what we've got here. But doing it that way is fine, and it is perfectly, absolutely correct. Of course, they wouldn't have done it if it wasn't. But the other way to look at it, this is, forget the terms without x in it, this is going to be a very large positive number because x is going to positive infinity. This, of course, will also be a very large positive number. And uh, if you just look at those ratios, this will be 3x, and this will be the square root of 2 times x, 3 over root 2, okay. as x is positive. However, when you turn it around and do x less than 0, where x is going to negative infinity, then your x is not the square root of x squared because x is negative, and square root of x squared is positive, so you have to make x the negative square root of x squared. And as you do the same thing you did before, when you divide by x here, you have to divide down here by negative x squared. Now, to me, this is the awkward way to do it, but it certainly is correct. And when you do that, everything else pans out the same, and you wind up with... 3 minus 0 over a negative, square root of 2 plus 0. Now they're going to go back and put them in the limits of this one, and then jump to the last one. Uh, and that way the minus sign gets picked up here. And the rest is, is straightforward, 3 over 3 minus 0 over minus square root of 2 plus 0, that's minus 3 over root 2. However, if you think of it just in think as x is going to negative infinity here, that's going to be an extraordinarily large negative number. This will be an extraordinarily large positive number, so you know your ratio has got to be a negative. And do the ratio of 3 of x over the square root of x squared, that's going to be 1, and this will be 
3 over root 2, but it had to be negative, so it would be negative 3 over root 2. That's probably the more, again, more elegant way uh, or precise way, but when you're thinking of it, that makes perfect sense. When I'm thinking of it, it does anyway. I don't know about you. All right. That was example four. Ah, and here is the uh, graph of this one. And again, no vertical asymptotes because that denominator will never be zero. And what's inside the denominator will never be negative because this is always uh, positive plus one would be a positive number. So this is defined everywhere, uh, and this will be the graph of it. So approach positive infinity, you're going to 3 over root 2, which I assume is something just a little bit greater than 2, because 3 is 3, and root 2 is about 1.4, so it's a little bit less than 1.5, so the ratio is going to be a little bit more than, than 2. 3 over 1.5 would be exactly 2, unless you have a little bit greater than that. Down here, it's approaching negative 3 over root 2, which is a bit less than uh, negative 2. And you see it can cross a horizontal asymptote right here. No sweat there. In the long run, it's approaching it. In the long run, it's approaching that one as well. Does that make sense? Functions that are not rational may have different right and left horizontal asymptotes. They are rational functions. They got to be the same. Make sense? All right. Now, they're skipping examples five and six. So let's go back and pick up five and six. All right. The limit as x approaches infinity of sine x. What's your feeling on that one, folks? What's that? No, no, no. You're not taking a derivative of it. You're the limit. As x goes to infinity. Well, what does sine x do? Give me a description. Starts at zero at the origin. Yeah, it goes like this. Okay, as x goes to infinity, what's it going to do? It's still going up and down and up and down and up and down. Going from minus 1 to plus 1, minus 1 to plus 1, plus 1 to minus 1, minus 1 to plus 1. Forever and ever and ever. So this has no limit. That limit does not exist. It just keeps fluctuating. It does not exist. Okay? Now, yeah, that's all they say. As x approaches infinity, the sine function oscillates between plus 1 and minus 1, never changing, keeps doing that forever and ever, so it doesn't exist. Okay? Now, here's the b part. What's the limit as x goes to infinity of sine x over x? Hmm. What can we do with that? What's the limit of the numerator? Yeah, it stays between plus and minus 1, but waving at me. Okay, yeah. Okay, put it between plus and minus 1. That denominator increases without bound. So if this thing stays between plus and minus 1, you're divided by something that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. What's this going to be? Something that's always between plus and minus 1 divided by definitely large number that's going to zero. Exactly. It's 
still will be wavering up and down, but it's closer and closer and closer to zero as it goes. Okay? So, the picture is in your book. I will not be able to do it justice here, but uh, I'll give it a shot. First, can x ever equal zero? No. No. It's a zero over zero under, indeterminate case, so we won't even go into that now. We'll just put a an open circle there. But it would be close to one, and in fact it would be one. The limit would be, but the function value is not defined or un, indeterminate. And what it does is goes down and up and down and up and down and up and down and up getting closer and closer and closer to zero, but never reaching zero. That's not a very accurate function, but you get the general idea. One in the book is a lot prettier, a little prettier anyway. Okay, there it is. Okay. It may actually mark off the indicators there. At the pies, it's always zero, uh, and then in between the pies, it's either the max or the min. They, they get closer and closer and closer together. Okay. Now, that's example five. Okay. Now, they actually go back and use the squeeze theorem, and you can if you want to, but numerators between plus and minus one, denominator zero, I mean, infinitely large. That ratio is going to zero. All right. Let's clear this out of the way. And let's do example six. Now, example six is a applied type problem. Let f of t measure the level of oxygen in a pond. f of t level, I can't write, of O2 in a pond. Okay? Where f of t is equal to 1 is the normal unpolluted level. That's pretty ugly writing. Okay. Now, T is measured in weeks. Okay, T is measured in weeks. When T is equal to zero, later we'll call this a initial value problem, organic waste is dumped into the pond, and as the waste material oxidizes, the level of oxygen of the pond is decreased. And here is the function. F of t is equal to t squared minus t plus 1 over t squared plus 1. Now, The question here, excuse me, is what percent of the normal level of oxygen exists in the pond after one week? Now this really requires no calculus, okay, until the very last question, okay? Uh, but what is the percentage of normal level of oxygen existing in the pond after one week? So after one week, what would be your f of t, where f of t is the level oxygen in the pond. So f of 1 would be what? Anybody? Okay, that'd be 1 minus 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 
these two add to zero, and you get 1 over 2. So after one week, you have half the normal level of oxygen. My guess, you're going to lose about half your fish, okay? Maybe not quite that many, but they won't be healthy, okay? So, it's really dropped down, okay? After two weeks, what's alpha of two? Anybody? Okay, it'll be four, right? Two squared is four, minus two, plus one, over two squared is four, plus one, and this will be what? Say again. Three over five. So this will be 60%. This will be 50%. It seems to be getting better. Okay, let's do 10 weeks. F of 10 is equal to, whoa, 10 squared is 100 minus 10 plus 1 divided by 100 plus 1. What will that give you? 91 over 101. Someone punch that into your calculator real quickly and see what percentage that is. 91 divided by 101. I could do the first two in my head. This one, not going to be far from 0.9, but what would it be? Say again? 90%? Okay. Approximately 90%. Okay, what would it be as x as t approaches infinity? Well, then you'd have to do the limit of this as t approaches infinity of t squared minus t plus 1 over t squared plus 1. And what would that be? There's a T there. What would that be? Ratio of leading terms? 1. So 100%. Okay. Now, uh, might say, do you ever get rid of that minus T? No, you don't, but after a while it's insignificant. Okay. Uh, but, that is assuming you don't dump any more organic waste in there. But if you keep dumping it in, then I'm pretty sure you can wind up with something less than one half. I don't know if this model would allow that, uh, but after a while you completely overwhelm the system and you have a dead pond, okay? It's so filled with organic matter. Oh, they put 90.1%. And after a while, it gets back to 100. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. Now, this next part, I don't want to spend a lot of time on uh, because infinite limits at infinity. Guess what? If it's an infinite limit, it's not a limit. Okay. It's, it, that's, to me, a contradiction in terms. Okay. But here are their definitions. Many functions do not approach a finite limit as x approaches uh, increases or decreases without bound. For instance, no polynomial function has an infinite limit, has a finite limit at infinity. We learned this back when we were doing po polynomial functions. They either go to the positive infinity, negative infinity, right or left. They got to go to one of the two because your leading term dominates, and that's going to tell you what where it's going. Uh, so this is used to describe the behavior of polynomial and other functions at infinity. If f, let f be a function described on the interval from a to positive infinity, in other words, increasing positively without bound, the limit, the statement limit of f of 
x as x goes to infinity is infinity that means for any positive number m there's a corresponding number capital n greater than zero such that f of x greater than m capital m whenever x is greater than n okay capital n okay i mean you can name it that way to me it has no limit okay that's what it means it, the limit of f x goes to infinity is infinity that means it doesn't have a limit and when it says negative infinity that means for each negative number m capital m there's a corresponding capital n greater than zero so it's for f of x is always will be less than capital m whenever x is greater than that positive m okay similar definitions could be given for the statements uh, limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x going to positive infinity and x limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x. To me, why bother with all these? The limits don't exist. So why call them a limit? I don't know. Okay? What do you reckon this is doing? As x goes to positive infinity, what happens when you cube the x? It's even more positive. It's even larger, but it's infinity. I mean, so I don't know. What happens to the limit of as x going to negative infinity to x cubed? Where is x cubed going? It's going to negative infinity. Because a negative number times a negative number is positive, that be squared. But times another negative is going to be negative, so it's going to negative infinity. So I don't know. As x increases without bound, x cubed also increases without bound. So we write it that way. It has no limit. As x decreases without bound, x cubed also decreases without bound. So it has no limit. So there's the function. Okay? Now, those results agree with the leading coefficient test for polynomial functions. Uh, and I don't like calling it leading coefficient test. I like to call it leading term test because that tells you more, okay? And that's all they do with that. Thank goodness. Okay. Uh, so they do another example, but I really don't think it, it's worth doing. They're going to infinity. <laughs> you know, Positive or negative, they're going to infinity. Now, homework exercises here. I would do all of the exercises 5 through 10. Now, the answers are in the book and at calpchat.com for only the odds, 5 through 9. But you can do all uh, six of those because it's just matching the functions with their uh, graphs. Okay? Then number 11 is at both CalCHAT and CalcView. 13 and 15 are both at CalCHAT. 13 is at CalcView. Uh, do any of the odds, seven, uh, 17 through 35, they're all at CalCHAT. 25 is at CalcView. Do either 37 or 39, they're both at CalCHAT. And there at 37, they threw in an absolute value function. you should got to think through that one a little bit. Uh, 41 should be at CalCHAT. 43 and or 45 should be at count chat. 47 and or 49 should be at count chat. Uh, 51 is an engine efficiency problem, which is a pretty reasonable thing to think about sometimes. So that should be at count chat. All right. Here's is it Joy. All right. What page? Uh, 206, 207, and maybe 208, okay, I'm on 207 right now. You can explore doing either 53 or 55, they should both be at Calc Chat. 57 is a modeling data problem, if you want to do that one, it should be at Calc Chat. 59 and or 61 are both use the definitions of limit at infinity. So I'll let you decide whether you want to do those or not. I sure don't uh, 
yeah, those would both be pretty good to do. Uh, then you can do either 63 or 65. They're both uh, should be at Calc Chat. Uh, 67 should be at Calc Chat, and 69 is a proof that if you want to do that, you certainly can as well. Okay. Now, the next section kind of summarizes some stuff that we we did in bits and pieces here and there. It's going to put them all together. Okay. Uh, so 3.6 Don't take a while to come up. Um, don't take a, a while to do the section. I think we can probably get it done just today. Um, is this? It's a little early from what we usually do, but because we're changing sections right now, would this be a good time for a break? What you think? Yay or nay? Want a break or not? No? Want to keep trucking? Anybody? If you need a break, we can take it. I know a few people just got here, so you may not need a break, but anyone does do want one? What you think? Say it if you do. Nobody does? No, did someone say take a break? I can't hear. Wait a few more minutes. Okay, let's do that. All right. We'll go to slideshow from current slide. Okay, still in Chapter 3, Application of Differentiation. 3.6 is a summary of curve sketching. What we'll do, our objective here is to analyze and sketch the graph of a function. We've got all the tools in our tool belt. We'll take them from scratch now. Okay, and the topic is analyzing the graph of a function. Okay, when you're sketching graph of a function, either by hand or with a graphing utility, remember that normally you cannot show the entire graph. You can't do it by hand, and your graphing utility has some limits too. The decision as to which part of the graph you choose is to show is often the crucial part. So that's what we're sort of going to focus on. Where do we need to focus our efforts here? For instance, which of the viewing windows here uh, better represents the graph of f of x is equal to x cubed minus 25x squared plus 74x minus 20. Now, anytime you have big coefficients like this, you got to be really careful with the viewing window. If you were to start with minus 10 to plus 10, minus 10 to plus 10, you're not going to show a whole lot here, okay? Because that would go from here to there and from here to there. So you, would, you wouldn't see much of anything. It wouldn't be continuous or anything else. But even this one, minus 2 to 5 and minus 10 to 40, shows you that. And if you think that's your function, you're seriously mistaken. Okay? It can't be. Now, what I want to do, and I think the book will do this, is draw you back into your pre-calculus algebra days. If you looked at a function like this, what can you tell me? Just looking at the first term, that leading term. What does the cubic function tell you? Okay, it's going to dominate. Okay, it's going to be the big number, the big, the big dog in the room. Okay, as x goes to positive or negative infinity. Doesn't tell you much about what's happening close to zero. It tells you what happens in the long run. But in the long run, where's that function going? As x is very large positive, where's that function going? Okay. Give me a large x. 10? 10 cubed is? What? 10 cubed is? 1,000. Guess what? That thing's taking off and going. And 10 is not a very large number. Maybe it would be a large number, but that would be 
So I'm going to throw you in resilience or something like that, okay? Out of reach. Okay, what happens when X goes negative? Let's use negative 10. What's negative 10 cubed? Negative 1,000. So guess what? This function is getting out of sight as X gets large positively or negatively. This looks like it's going down both directions. You know that's not true. It can't be true. There's got to be more to the picture than this. This has to turn around somewhere and take off and go here. This could be true, and it is true. This is not true, okay? This is a false perception. That looks like it's going down negatively, never coming up again. You know it can't be true, okay? You expand your range from negative 2 to 5 to negative 10 to 30. It's not a huge expansion here, but then to get every the details shown here, you have to go from negative 1,200 to positive 200, and then you see there is a lot more going on here that <clears throat> met the eye here. This one can't, is believable because it's going down here and up here. But not just that. What else did you learn in pre-calculus algebra about a cubic function? What's the most number of zeros it can have? Three. three. This one shows two. Now, it doesn't mean it has to have three, but with this going down here, you know it has to come back up. This shows three. Doesn't matter how much you expand this way or this way, never coming back again, never coming back up again, because you've already reached a maximum number of zeros. What's the other thing that pre-calculus algebra told us about this? How many turning points can this have at most? Two, one less than this. And there's one turning point, another turning point. This graph shows everything you need to know. It shows where it's going. When X goes to negative, the end behavior, X goes very negative, it's going down. Very positive, going up. It shows both of those well. It shows you do have three zeros. You don't have to. That would be the most. If you got three, there can't be any more zeros. you got at most two turning points. can't have any more. Nothing else new is going on past this or here. So continue going down, continue going down. Okay? So use all the tools, the skills that you learn in pre-calculus as well as what we've learned so far in calculus. Okay? But calculus will tell us even more. What can you do to this function to tell you something else about it? What's the good Jesus answer in the Take a derivative. And what does that tell you? Yes, sign the zeros with that derivative that equals zero. And what would that help us? Where these turning points are, where the first derivative is zero. If you knew that, then you say, ah, yeah, I know I have to expand this because we have another turning point down here somewhere. Okay? Got to. Okay? Guess what else you could do? So if you take the one derivative, Take another one. Take a second derivative. What would that take? Concave up or concave down. That's what the second derivative tells you. And it would have told you it's concave down here, concave up here, and keeps on going. With one change, that would be your point of inflection right in here somewhere. Okay? So you see, calculus tells us a few more things than what we got in pre-calculus. Pre-calculus got us started, though. Okay. I see both views there. It's clear the second viewing window gives more complete representation of the graph, and in fact, a very good representation. Would a third viewing window reveal other interesting positions? Portions? Probably not. Because anything further this way, just keep going downhill. Anything further that way, keep going up. After this, you need to use calculus to interpret the first and second derivatives. That's what we were just saying. All right. To determine a good viewing window for a function, use these guidelines to analyze this graph. Okay? Determine the domain and range of the function. Always a good thing to know. Now, what are going to be the things that will determine the domain? What are the things you watch out for in a domain of a function? We talked about at least one of them today, probably two, just barely, 
The third one we didn't mention much today, but we've mentioned before. What are the three things you consider with the domain? You cannot have zero in a denominator. Anywhere you have zero in the denominator, that function can exist. Okay? So that's going to be one limit to the domain. That's going to represent a vertical asymptote on the graph. Right? So that's one thing. Okay? Another thing that will influence the domain. Second. Okay, that's usually where we start. We'll assume the domain is going to be all real numbers unless one of these three incidents occur. We've already named one. Zero in the denominator. It can't occur then. What's another one? We had one in an earlier function when we had functions that weren't rational functions. What were those examples? When you had a... Yes, square roots. What can square roots? What's the limitation there? You can't take the square root of a negative number. Or you can't take any even root of a negative number. Odd roots, no sweat. Even roots, you can't take the even root. That would influence the domain. If your numerator or denominator has a radical in it, and it's a square root, or a fourth root, or a sixth root, or a fourteenth root, or any even root, you cannot have under that radical anything that ever goes negative. Okay? Anyone remember the third thing we consider in a domain? We haven't mentioned them today, but I know we've mentioned them. What is a limit? Uh, a limitation. Let me put it that way. Say again? Of something that you can't do with your variable. You can't divide by zero. You can't take the square root of a negative number, or even any even root of a negative number. It's one other thing. It's another function. Is it square root? Okay, we already said square root. The log function. What can you never take the log of? Negative number or zero. Either one of them. So if you have a variable in a denominator, a variable under a square root, or a variable in a log function, you've got to watch out and see what limitations you have in the domain. Now the range of the function, they are a lot harder to determine the ranges. You just have to really think hardly hard about how that function looks. Okay? So this is a simple little statement. The domain, though, is fairly easy. Look at those. Three things, variables in the denominators, variables under square roots, and variables in the logarithm. Now the range of the function, basically in behavior and asymptotes, vertical asymptotes. Well actually, in behavior covers just about every, well no, asymptotes covers just about every. Okay, number two, determine the intercepts, we mentioned that, the asymptotes, I just mentioned that one. And symmetry. Symmetry can be a big help, okay? The symmetry of the graph. Is it even? Is it odd? Is it symmetric about some other thing rather than the y-axis, okay? So uh, that was the second thing. Domains and ranges, intercept, asymptotes, and symmetry. And locate the x values for which the first derivative and the second derivative are either zero or do not exist. Remember, both of those we consider. So the first derivative is zero, first derivative doesn't exist, the second derivative is zero, or second derivative never exists. Use the results to determine relative extrema points of inflection. First derivatives tell you relative extrema, second derivatives uh, points of inflection. What's the point of inflection? Someone remind me. What is the point of inflection? The first derivative is where the 
direction changes from positive to negative or negative to positive. That's where a first group is. What does the second group is have? Yes, where the concavity changes. Okay? It could be concave up for a while, concave down for a while, where that changes at the point of reflection. And that could be where the second group is zero or where the second group is does not exist. Always start with domain. Because if you find a value that's not in the domain, certainly the first and second derivatives are not going to be valid at those points. So uh, always start with the domain. So let's do this one. Analyze and sketch. Okay. We're at the halfway point. We want a break now or not? Okay, let's take one now. Then we'll come back and do example. Uh, all right, where we left off, we were going, <clears throat> if I can talk, I can't rub this eye much, but it itches like crazy. That may be why my eyes are giving me problems today, too. Um, analyze and sketch the graph of this function, f of x equal 2x squared minus 9 over x squared minus 4. All right. Now, where I like to begin, we're analyzing the function, also sketching the graph of the function, which basically is kind of doing the same thing. But let's start with, go back to pre-calculus and talk about, well, okay, what kind of function is this? It's got something in the numerator, something in the denominator. Both of those somethings have the variable in them, so what kind do we call this? A rational function, because those somethings in the numerator and denominator are both polynomials. For if you have a ratio of two polynomial functions, that's called a rational function. If you have a ratio of a polynomial function to a, ra a radical function, no, that's not rational. It's a ratio, but it's not two polynomial functions. So. This is a rational function. So what two features might you look for with rational functions? Well, there's actually four things you look for. Maybe even with more than four. No, nah, four, I think we'll do it. A rational function can have vertical asymptotes. It can have horizontal asymptotes. It can have either or neither or both. Okay? And it can have multiple verticals. We'll never have more than one horizontal asymptote if it's a rational function. If those are, one of those is a radical, yeah, you could have more than one horizontal asymptote as well. Okay? So, those are the features we're going to look for. Uh, which one of those you want to start with? One of your asymptotes? Okay, asymptotes, we, we mentioned those. Horizontal vertical. The other thing to look for, let's go back here for just a moment, is our intercepts. We can have x-intercepts, possibly multiple x-intercepts, how many y-intercepts may you have? No more than one. You may not have any, but you can't have more than one. Why can you not have more than one y-intercept? The y-axis is a vertical line, isn't it? What's true about functions? Any function. Vertical line. Yes, it has a passive vertical line test. And what does that test? Um, it can only cross the vertical line once. Okay. So therefore, since the y-axis is a vertical line, it, you can only have one y-intercept. You may not have any, but you can have no more than one. X-intercepts you can have multiple. So we're going to look for. X-intercepts and Y-intercepts, if you have one. 
vertical asymptote or horizontal asymptote if it's a rational function, and we'll maybe do a little bit of symmetry. Okay, so those are the things we look for first. Well, actually, first we really should talk about domain. What's going to be the domain of that function? Are there, as uh, uh, Jalen said, we always start with assuming all real numbers unless you find some exceptions. Any exceptions here? Yes, x cannot equal positive 2 or negative 2 because both values make that denominator 0. Can't have a 0 denominator, so here we have from negative infinity up to negative 2, from negative 2 to positive 2, and from positive 2 to positive infinity. So we have two, three <coughs> regions of our, of our domain separated by your, what are those two points called? Vertical asymptotes, exactly. Now, that's not always the case if there's a common factor in the numerator. If there's a common factor in the numerator, either one of these factors down here, then you might wind up with a hole in the graph, but not a vertical asymptote. No common factors here. Okay. So, <clears throat> that's sort of getting at the next thing you probably we should do. In fact, it's usually not a bad thing to do to begin with. Factor everything in sight. Okay, so let's rewrite this just ever so slightly. Let me get my pen set up. Okay, two is a factor, but it's not a very uh, meaningful factor here. It will have meaning later. What else? Second, x plus three times x minus three in the denominator. Anybody? X plus 2 times X minus 2. Okay. That gives me a little more detail. Okay. <clears throat> As I already mentioned, the domain is limited by X cannot equal plus 2 or minus 2. Okay. But what does that numerator tell me? Okay, I heard murmur, murmur, murmur. Say again? A little louder. That's what? The numerator can equal zero. That's no problem. The denominator can't equal zero. But what happens where the numerator is equal to zero? Anything special there? Be what? Uh, possibly, but let's go back to this again. What are these key words do we have if we have zero in the numerator? Uh, no, 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 that's, that, that's your ratio of leading coefficients. We'll come back to that. It's intercept. It's the x-intercept where the numerator is equal to zero, that's where the whole function is equal to zero, right? And where the function is equal to zero, that's the y is equal to zero, that's your x-axis. Those are your x-intercepts. So what can you tell me about x-intercepts? Okay, x-intercepts are points, so always give these as ordered pairs. Three, zero, and minus three, zero. Say again? That's your vertical asymptote. So I should have put that here. So the vertical asymptotes are also x cannot equal 2 and x cannot equal negative 2. Those are your vertical asymptotes. Your x-intercepts are where your numerator are 0. Okay? Because that's where it crosses the y-axis because that's where the function is equal to 0. Okay. Now, should have done this earlier, perhaps, or I think I'll just do it now. I'm going to, this time, multiply through 
that 2x squared minus 18, which actually makes it worse, over x squared minus 4. Now, what does that form tell me? We got our vertical asymptotes here. What does that one tell us? Horizontal asymptotes. And what gives us that? You did it not long ago. The ratio of the leading terms. And what's the ratio of the leading terms? Y is equal to 2. There's your horizontal asymptote. Y is equal to 2. Okay. Now one thing we haven't done, and I think it's best now to go back to our original form, no, this form right here is fine. Okay. I'm going to get that line out of the way. Okay. I'm going to make that equal sign look a little bit more like an equal sign. Okay. Now, we've got vertical asymptote, horizontal asymptote. X intercept, what are we missing? Vertical asymptote, horizontal asymptote. X intercept. The what? What you say? Y intercept? Y intercept? Yeah, exactly. I thought that's what you did, so I don't hear well. So how do we get our Y intercept? That's where the X intercepts are where Y is equal to zero. So guess what the Y intercepts are? Where X equals zero. So in that form right there, let's just plug in X equals zero. What do we get? Pretty exciting. Nine over two. Nine over two. There's your x, uh, your y-intercept. Y-intercept. But now we write intercepts as ordered pairs. What would that ordered pair be? Zero. Zero. Nine halves. Isn't that what you said? All right. Now that's about the limit of what we can get from our pre-calculus. You did all this back in pre-calculus. Now let's use calculus to give us a few other pieces of information. Okay. Now, which form do I want? Actually, I think I like the second form better than the first. Factored form helps us go vertical asymptotes and uh, x-intercepts. That's useful there. But this form, I think, will be helpful in doing our calculus analysis. And what two things do we do in calculus? Take a derivative. So what's your f prime of x? And this form, unfortunately, we're going to have to use the what? The what? Which rule? Quotient rule. How does that go? Okay, a little out of it. I can't hear. Okay, it's low, which is x squared minus 4, d high, which is second, derivative of the numerator, 4x. Okay, next, minus. high, 2x squared minus 18, d low, which is 2x, all over low, low, x squared minus 4 squared. Okay. Now, what two things do we consider about the first derivative? Well, let's simplify a little bit first. See what we can get out of it. That would be a 4x cubed minus 16x, right? Minus 4x cubed plus 
36x. Hmm. No constants in here anywhere, are there? Okay. All over x squared minus 4 squared. So if we combine like terms, oh, looky here. The x cubed terms disappear. They add to 0. What do the other two give you? 20x over x squared minus 4 squared. Okay. Now, remember what we said here. This was your domain. The limitations on the domain. X can't be plus or minus 2. Okay. Hang on to that. The function cannot be defined at x equals plus or minus 2. The function can. So what two things do we consider at your first derivative? Well, that first derivative is either what or what? Why do we take the first derivative of it anyway? Second? Okay, it will tell you the slope at any point, so what special slopes are we looking for? When the first derivative is either zero or here we have it, folks, where the first and second derivative are either zero or do not exist, not defined. Those are what we're interested in when we take our derivative. Either where the Derivatives are zero or not defined. So let's first look at where is that first derivative zero? At here's your first derivative, L prime of x is equal to that. Where is that equal to zero? It's the only way that it can make that zero. Say again? Yeah, where the first derivative is equal to zero. Where is that going to happen? At x equals zero. Exactly. Okay? We're going to have to come up with a point, but the first derivative is going to be when x equals zero. Do we want to plug back in and see what the value is when x equals zero? Ha! We know that. At your y intercept, nine halves. When x equals zero, the y value is 9 halves. So there's going to be a C1. In fact, that's going to be our only critical value, the critical point. That's x equals 0, y is equal to 9 halves. Okay? That's the only place that first derivative will be 0. Is there any place that first derivative will not exist? Plus or minus 2, but you see the function doesn't exist there. So don't consider that one because the function that can't exist there. So that's sort of out of the picture here because x can't be those anyway. Okay? But sure enough, it can exist there, but those aren't critical values. Those are values that they don't exist. Those are vertical asymptotes. Okay? So we've got one more piece of information. We have a critical point at uh, x equals 0. Before we go on to analyze that critical point, though, let's go on and do our second derivative. What's the second derivative? How does that go? Say that again. Okay, it's yeah, low, which is x squared minus 4 squared times 20 minus 20x high 
Ooh, D low. What in the world is that D low now? 2 times x squared minus 4 to the first power times 2x. Okay, and all that is over x squared minus 4 to the fourth power. You got it. So let's clean up that denominator, the numerator a little bit and see what we've got. Well, we've got to square this one first, so that's going to be x to the fourth minus 8x squared plus 16 times 20 minus 20 times a 2, 20x times 2x squared is going to be 40x cubed times another 2x is going to be 80x to the fourth, if I did my math right. Okay, and then we've got a minus 20x times a minus 8, that'll be plus 160x times 2x is plus 320x. Whew. And all that's over x squared minus 4 to the fourth. Okay. Well, let's see what happens when we multiply these things out. This is going to give us 20x to the fourth minus 160 x squared plus 320 minus 80 x to the fourth plus 3 that's 320 x squared isn't it because you had a 20 x minus 4 and minus 20 x minus 4 and positive 2 x so that'd be x squared Square. Oh, what a mess. All right. Your x to the fourth terms are going to be minus 60 x to the fourth. Is this what they're getting? Goodness gracious, what a messy problem. Uh, they came out with a much simpler one than we did. Well, we haven't finished yet, so let's try it. See, I don't like using quotient rule, as you may have guessed. Ugh, what a mess. Let's go back and use product rule. Let me make sure I got first derivative right. No, I didn't even get the first root. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong one. Sorry about that. Wait. First derivative is 20x over that. And second derivative is that. So, yeah, we have it. Yeah, we're going. Let's keep trucking. Okay. Minus 20x to the fourth. Okay. No, minus 60x to the fourth. plus 160x squared plus 320 over x squared minus fourth to the fourth. Okay. Now, obviously we can factor something out of the numerator. What do you think that's going to be? They suggest a minus 20. I think that'll do it. So let's pull a minus 20 out. And that will give us 3x to the fourth minus 
minus 8x squared, no, plus, you know, minus 8x squared. minus 16. Now, oops, it's to the fourth. Can't read my own writing. Okay. Now they're suggesting we can factor out an x squared minus 4. Let's see if we can. I'm going to do, not supposed to, but synthetic division with x squared. So I'm going to do a 4 on the outside, a 3 minus 8 minus 16 on the inside. Skip a line, draw a line, and bring down the 3. That will be 12, that will be 4, that will be 16. Yes, you can factor out a uh, x squared minus 4. I just don't have much room, so let me write it up here. That will be a minus 20 times x squared minus 4, and what you have left is a 3x squared plus 4 divided by x squared minus 4 to the fourth, and this one will knock out that and make it to the third. And that's how they get the minus 20 times 3x squared plus 4 over x squared minus 4 to the third. There's your front second derivative. I can't write. Goodness gracious. Okay. Now, All right. A lot of mess on the board. What I'm going to do is erase all but the essential mess, okay? Because <laughs> there's just too much here. We don't need our synthetic division anymore. We do need our second derivative. I think I'll clean it up some, though. We don't need our factorization anymore. Okay or any of these extra forms anymore. We do need that information. We don't need this anymore, or that, or anything here at the bottom anymore. Okay? Our first derivative we need, but we need only the final form, and that's this one over here. Just doing this because I need more room. Oh, I wiped out something I thought I needed, but I think I wrote it over here too. Yeah, I got it. Okay. I don't think I need anything else down here. I hope not anyway. Okay, and maybe pulling some stuff together a little bit more nicely. Let me rewrite my first derivative here. Alpha prime of x is equal to 20x over x squared minus 4 squared. And alpha double prime of x equal minus 20 times 3x squared plus 4 over x minus 4, x squared minus 4 cubed. All right, now I'll get rid of those others as well. And I wanted to remind you something I meant not to erase, but I erased it. Re 
remember this is also our critical point is zero because that's where the first derivative is zero. Now, that's our stuff. You've already analyzed where this is equal to zero. That's going to be a critical point. That's going to be a critical point right there. But we didn't say where this thing was not equal, it does not exist. And where does this not exist? Well, we did say it. The places where the function doesn't exist. So that doesn't make it a critical point. It has to be in the domain, and these are out of the domain. Okay? Now, where is our second derivative equal to zero? <coughs> x equal 4? No, no, no. Where is the second derivative equal to 0? Guess what, folks? It never is. That denominator is always, well, no, I can't say that either, can I? Yeah, so x equals 4 times 0. Okay. In the numerator, that numerator is always negative, because this thing's always positive, right? The numerator is always negative. The denominator, though, it could be positive or negative. It's positive out here to the left of uh, minus 2. So the first derivative, the second derivative is negative out here. The denominator is negative between minus 2 and 2, right? So that means the second derivative is positive there. So it's concave up, it's, it's concave down out there, concave up here, but then concave down again, then 2, because the denominator is positive beyond 2. But this is always negative. So we know something about this. There is no inflection point. Those inflections, the changes come where the function doesn't exist. Okay? So, uh, we know just about everything our first and second derivatives can tell us. Which was a whole lot more, but it's a little bit more. Concavity? Concavity? Okay. It's where the second derivative is positive, it's concave up, negative, it's concave down. Zero or doesn't exist, it could or not be a inflection point. Okay? So, there's no place where this thing is zero. No place, because this is positive always, and the numerator would have to be zero for that to be good. So there's no place where it's zero. The only place that would be potentially not existing is at plus or minus two, but those are not in the domain. So those are not out of the question, okay? Now, it does change direction there, but we don't call them inflection points because they're not in the domain, okay? Now, Here's something that is. Like I said, the numerator is always negative, because this is always positive, that's always negative. The numerator is always negative. The denominator is positive beyond minus 2 and beyond positive 2, because x squared is greater than 4 in those values. It's negative here, because x squared is less than 4 in between minus 2 and 2. Okay. So that makes this negative there, because that's a cube there. Well, the numerator negative and the denominator, that means it's concave up, I'm sorry, concave up here, so that makes our critical point, since it's in that range, a minus. So a combination of your uh, from x equal negative infinity to negative 2, your, your expression here is concave down. When it's between negative 2 and 2, your concavity is positive, concave up. And when it's between 2 and infinity, you're concave down again. Okay? Now, those are inflection points there. Though they change concavity, but because those are not points that the function is even defined at. Now, since it's concave up, 
in the place where your critical point is, that means that critical point has to be a minimum. So now we found our minimum. It's your y-intercept. It's also your ex local extrema, local minimum. So now we can do a good job of graphing the function, okay, or at least a credible job. Let's put our vertical asymptotes in, okay. I'm going to put them in red because you can't touch them, okay. I tried to put them in red. There we go. Negative 2 and positive 2. Okay. Vertical asymptotes are there. Horizontal asymptote, let's go on and put that in while I'm there. Well, I forgot to mark my scale. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. Horizontal asymptote was also was at y is equal to 2. Okay, that divvies up our, our function, okay? Now let's put the points we know. X-intercept, 3, 0, right there, and negative 3, 0, right there. That gives us just about everything we need to know in that sector. The Y-intercept is 0, 9 halves. That's 4 and a half. Uh, one, two, three, four and a half, right there. Okay? Now, boy, we've got it. That's everything we need to know. Why do I say that? Because here, the function as it goes toward positive infinity has to be approaching that horizontal asymptote. As it goes near the uh, vertical asymptote, it has to be going to negative infinity. Can't cross it. Over here, the same thing. As it increases, it's approaching the horizontal asymptote. As it goes close to the vertical asymptote, it can't cross it, so it has to keep going downhill. Okay? Now, we found out here, because it's concave up, here it has to be going up like this. There's the function. There it is. I mean, that's all we need to know. We didn't need to do a single test point. Sure enough, we found out it was concave down here, concave up there, and concave down here. Our graph illustrates that. The, they're not points of inflection because they're not defined, but that would be where your uh, undefined, where your vertical asymptotes are. They change concavity there, but they don't call them points of inflection because they're not on the graph. They're outside the graph. That's it. Now, just using what they, we knew. Vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes. X-intercepts, Y-intercepts. First derivative, uh, critical points. Second derivative, concavity. You get all that, you've got the whole graph done for you. Now, you won't always. Sometimes you will have to do a test point or two just to fill in the gap. In this one, we didn't need to do a single test point. We had everything we needed. Okay? Make sense? Okay. If you look at what the book did, uh, I don't think their picture is quite as pretty as mine. Let's see if I can get this here. So there we have it. Vertical asymptotes is negative x equal negative 2, y is equal, I mean x equal positive 2. Horizontal asymptote, y is equal to 2. We got all those. Your intercept is the three, negative 3, 0, and positive 3, 0. Your y intercept is 0, 9 halves, exactly like we did. Found out it was a negative minimum. Why? Because it was concave up at that point. So it had to be a negative minimum. And it was concave down everywhere out here. So we basically have everything we need to know without a single test point. Okay, I, they didn't do a test point. Good for them, okay? Uh, that gave them everything they needed. Well, why was I holding up the book? They're going to do it right now. All right for me to erase? Yeah or no? Yeah. Okay. Let's watch them do it.
Domain, all real numbers except plus or minus, x equal plus or minus 2, exactly like we found. We didn't do the range because basically only after you draw the graph can you really determine the range, okay? Uh, but it's from 9 halves up is the positive part and from uh, negative infinity up to positive 2 is the lower part. So from negative infinity up to 2 and then from uh, 9 halves to... And you can't tell that looking at it. So don't let them fool you here. You can't look at the function and say, oh, I know that's got to be the range. No, you have to draw the graph first, okay? And when we draw the graph, I'll come back and show you, yeah, that's the range, okay? Uh, X-intercepts we figured out to be minus 3, 0 and 3, 0. We got those. Y-intercept was 0, 9 halves. We got that one too. Vertical asymptotes, that's where it can't exist, plus or minus 2, x equal plus or minus 2. Horizontal asymptote, y is equal to 2, you got from ratio of leading terms. Okay? Symmetry, it is, oh, I didn't go over that, but it is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. How do we know that? Can we look at the function and know that? Anybody? Can you look at that function and tell me it's symmetric? Yay or no? I see you head shaking. No? Yeah, you can. Look at the exponents. They're all even. They're both two. They're both all even. That means it's an even function, so it's going to be symmetric about the y axis. So we could have said that. We found it out. Say again? I mean, it's so that that's a form of asymptote. How do you know it's the y axis? Say that one more time. They both have the same degree, okay? They're even. All the exponents are even, meaning it's an even function. So it has horizontal So, uh, no, even function means it's symmetric about the y-axis. An odd function would be symmetric about the origin. We don't really have anything that tells you if it's symmetric about the horizontal axis. It almost can't be if it's a function. Because if it's the same thing above and below, then you vertical you know, horizontal a vertical line test fails. Okay, so it can't be that. So we're only symmetric about the y-axis or about the origin. If it's even function, it's symmetric about the y-axis. Odd function about the origin. If it's neither, it's not symmetric about the, either any of those. So yes, we could have told that was a an even function. So it is symmetric about the y-axis. We back to the y-axis. All right. First derivative gave us that. They didn't show the hard part of doing that, but we did. Uh, second derivative is that. They didn't show how they got it, just showed that was the final answer, and that's what we got. Uh, critical number was x equals zero. That's where the first derivative is equal to zero. And the points of inflection, there are none. Even though you do have a change of concavity, you have two places where the second derivative doesn't exist, but those are the places where the function doesn't exist, so they're not in the domain of the function. It has to be in the domain of the function to be a point of inflection, or a critical number, okay? Because certainly those places where it doesn't exist, the first derivative doesn't exist either. Okay. We didn't need the test intervals, okay? But they are here from minus infinity to minus 2, from minus 2 to 0. We don't really need that one, or 0 to 2, and uh, 2 to infinity, okay? All right. Out here we had our x-intercept, so we know a value in there. You know it's a decreasing function because the second derivative is negative. The first derivative was negative. We didn't say that, but it is. Uh, it's concave down, so the second derivative is negative. So uh, it's got to be first derivative of negative 2. Okay? x equals negative 2. Nothing's defined there. First derivative, second derivative, or function. So you can't call it anything. 
except the vertebral asymptote, where the function is undefined. If it's not a removable discontinuity, that's going to be a vertebral asymptote. In between here, actually in between here, minus 2 to 2, we know we have the y-intercept there. We also know this is a critical value. The first derivative is 0. Uh, so, and the second derivative is positive there. You know that has to be a relative term. Okay? And everything else, uh, first derivative is negative here, decreasing positive there. But we knew that from the concave up term. Okay? X equal 2, vertical asymptote, anything beyond that, including our, y, our x intercept, 3, 0. First derivative is increasing, second derivative is decreasing. Increasing functions, what do you have? So, yeah, that gave us all. Now, once you draw the function, then you can say its range is from negative infinity to, to 2, parentheses 2. The range negative infinity to 2, but the 2 is not included because it never touches the horizontal asymptote. It could, but it doesn't, okay? And then it picks up again at 9 halves, and it does include that point. So you could have put a square bracket there, and it goes to positive infinity. So those are the y values telling you the range. But my contention is you can't determine the range just by looking at the function. You have to draw the graph and then say, yeah, it goes negative infinity up to 2, but doesn't touch 2. It touches at 9 halves and then goes to positive infinity. So that's how you express it. Really was a little unfair of them to say, to put it right at the beginning as if you could see that right off the top. You can't. You have to draw the graph to see that. Maybe y'all can figure it out, but I can't look at that and say, oh, got to be that. <laughs> Not going to happen. All right. I think we beat that to death, haven't we? Any questions? All right. Now, where does this pick up? Oh, okay. They skip example two. I thought they did. So let's go back and do example two. How are we doing on time? Well, we got plenty. Okay. Analyze and sketch the graph of f of x is equal to x squared minus 2x plus 4 divided by x minus 2. What might be a good thing to do first? Anybody? Second? I couldn't hear. Factor. If we can factor that numerator, that'd be a great idea. Do you think you can? Yeah. You do. How would it factor? Here's what I do. If it looks like I can't see how to factor it, here's what I do. Remember in the quadratic formula, what they called the discriminant? That was what was under the radical. B squared minus 4AC. Just do a quick thing there. B squared, that would be minus 2 squared, would be 4, minus 4 times A times C. That would be minus 16. 4 minus 16 negative 12. Hey, that's not going to be factorable. It's not even going to have a real zero. Okay? 
So, uh, and that just answered another question for me. This has no x intercept because that numerator is never zero. Never, ever zero. Okay? So, we just answered another question there. Uh, number one, you can't factor the numerator. Number two, uh, x intercepts none because there's no way that numerator will ever be zero okay so we can't factor the numerator so there's no chance of dividing out the denominator say that one more time I can't hear you first where the first derivative doesn't exist is that what you said no oh okay yeah Good. And where is that? Okay, domain x cannot equal what you say? Two. Two. Perfect. That's also going to be our vertical asymptote. Where the domain doesn't exist, that's where your vertical asymptote is going to be. Okay? So we knocked out two things there. We got the domain and we got the uh, vertical asymptote. All right. Now, What you go? What to go for next? And we have already determined no x-intercepts. Anything else? What might we look for next? Okay, we can do that. Let's knock out all the things we can know from our pre-calculus first. Second, so horizontal asymptote. Where would that be? ratio of your leading terms and what does that tell us there aren't any oh well ratio of the leading terms is x and as x goes to the positive or negative infinity as x goes to positive infinity it gets infinitely large x goes to negative infinity it gets infinitely small not going to have a horizontal asymptote so horizontal asymptote none However, it does have a slant asymptote. How do we know that? Because the degree of the numerator is exactly one more than the degree of the denominator. And we can do this division by synthetic division. What do we put on the outside? The opposite of the two, two. What do we put inside? Y'all forgotten your synthetic? You get 1 minus 2, 4. Okay? We've already determined there's not a uh, 0 here, but we can get this. So bring down the 1. 2 times 1 is 2. Add those, you get 0. Bring down a multiply, you get 0. And that will be 4. There's your remainder. So what we have here is x plus 4 over x minus 2. Okay? So your slant or oblique line is x is y is equal to x. That's going to be your identity function. And then after that you have uh, you pick up at plus or minus uh, at x equal 2. So we'll get that in a minute. We'll come back and get that. Okay, so we've determined no x-intercepts, no horizontal asymptote. We've got our vertical one and only vertical asymptote. What are we missing from pre-calculus? One last thing. We got x-intercept, but we don't have our y-intercept. How do you get the y-intercept? set x equals 0. So go back to your original function, set x equals 0, What's, what do we have left? Four over negative 2, which would be a negative 2, so that would be 0, negative 2. There's your y-intercept. Precalculus algebra doesn't leave us with a lot. We got 
a vertical asymptote, and we got a y-intercept. That's all, folks. No horizontal asymptote, no x-intercepts. So, we do have a slant asymptote, though, uh, and that's y is equal to x. Okay? So, let's go to our trig, I mean, our calculus part. Let's do our first derivative. What would that be? Anybody? First derivative. I can't hear you. Well, you could do either one. Uh, which would you prefer doing? <laughs> okay, so let's write, rewrite this so we can do the product rule. This would be x squared minus 2x plus 4 times x minus 2 to the minus 1 power. Perfect. Now let's do our first derivative from the product rule. That will, I like that better, but I'm surprised y'all do. Okay. What would that be? Okay, so what are you saying? Uh, it's the first function times the second the function prime plus. Okay, so the first, okay, first, so it's x squared minus 2x plus 4 times the derivative of the second, which is one. negative 1 times x minus 2 to the minus 2. It looks like a plus 2, but I was just trying to get... Oops. Okay. Okay. That's as good as I'm going to do. Okay. So there's the first part. What's the second part? Plus 2x minus 2 times x minus 2 to the minus 1. Okay. Now this is a little on the messy side, but I think we can handle it. This will be in our numerator, x squared minus 2x plus 4 with a minus sign out in front over x minus 2 squared plus 2x minus 2 over x minus 2. Okay. Now, to get least common denominator, we're going to have to multiply this by x minus 2 and multiply this by x minus 2. Right? Okay, I want to flip side, I mean flip... Uh, Put the plus in front first. So let's foil this one. That will be a 2x squared minus 4x minus 2x is minus 6x plus 4 over x minus 2 squared minus in fact, it's all over that, so let's just do a minus x squared plus 2x minus 4. We just distributed the minus across there. And this is going to give us 2x squared minus x squared is x squared minus 4x, and the plus 4 and minus 4 add to 0. Okay? over x minus 2 squared. Well, I know I can factor out an x. It's not going to help me any. At least with x minus 4 over x minus 2 squared. So that didn't help me any to do that, but at least you see it. Now, why did we take the first derivative? What did we investigate with that. 
critical numbers, and where are the, those found? Well, the first root of it is either. Okay, where is that equal to zero? F prime of x is equal to zero at, I see two different possibilities. At x equal zero or x equal four. Okay, now those are the critical numbers. I really like to have the critical points. So I want to plug x equals zero into my original function. And we already have done that. There's your, so this is also a critical point. Now, don't expect this always to be the case, but the last two problems I have, this is also a critical point. x equals zero, y is equal to negative two. Let's also do it for x equal four. Okay, so another critical point will be when x equal 4, and what's your y value there? That would be 4 squared is 16, minus 8 would be 8, plus 4 is 12, divided by 2 is 6. I think I did it right. Is that right? So, we got two critical points. Now, the others where it doesn't exist, that's at x equal 2. But guess what? The function doesn't exist at x equal 2. So, that's not in the domain of the function. So, it's not counted as a, uh, a critical point. Okay. Now, now the question is, we still got to do our Did the first derivative need our second derivative? Okay. Now, we can either use this form or we can modify that slightly and do it as a product rule. I really don't care which, which do you want to do. Push it rule in this form or product rule if we change it a little bit. You decide. Second? Last time we did, we did quotient. Last time we did quotient. Yeah. Okay, you want to push it rule again or you don't? No. Okay, let's do product rule. So let's rewrite this as x squared minus 4 times x minus 2 to the minus 2. Okay? What's that? I still can't do it. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. x squared minus 4x times x minus 2 to the minus 2. Okay. So let's do f double prime. All right. What's that going to equal? Um, x squared minus 4x times Okay. x squared minus 4x times negative 2, x minus 2 to the negative 3. You just lower it by 1. Lower the exponent by 1. Power rule, right? Okay. Oh, this is messy. Sorry. Um, let me write it up here. Alpha double prime x is equal to x squared minus 4x times minus 2 times x minus 2 to the minus 3. Okay, so I'll take it out from down here because it's getting way too crowded. And you see I can't write near the bottom because that's where my things like this are. Icons that I need to click on. So that's the first half of it. What's the second half? Uh, plus plus 2x, minus 2x minus 4 times your x minus 2 to the minus 2. Okay. Now let's write that back in rational notation. 
and I'm going to switch sides again. So on the numerator, it's going to be 2x minus 4 over x minus 2 squared minus, and we're going to have a 2x squared plus 4x over x minus 2 cubed. Now you tell me if I did that right. Now, yeah, I, I'll just say that again. I, I just changed the signs of those I probably shouldn't have. So let's put this in parentheses and change that back. Uh, I was doing too many steps at once and I realize that probably will be confusing. Okay. I flip sides. Okay. So we're going to have to multiply this term by another x minus 2, which means multiply this one by another x minus 2. It's supposed to be a 2 in there that didn't show up. Okay. So let's foil those. Yuck, I'm running out of room again. And this will be 2x squared. And you got a minus 4x minus 4x is minus 8x. Okay. I'm having trouble reading my writing here. Let me do it. Okay. You got 2x squared. I see that one. And a minus 4x and another minus 4x. A plus 8. That's what I'm missing. Plus 8. Okay. Knew I was missing something there. Minus... 2x squared plus 4x. Now I'm doing what I was planning to do earlier. Okay. When you combine these terms, and this is all over x minus 2 cubed. When you combine there, the x squared terms go out, and you have a minus 4x plus 8 over x minus 2 cubed, which I think they factor to be a minus 4 times x minus 2 over that. Ha! Huh. And then one of the x minus 2s go out. If I did it right, no, it says I didn't. Um, yuck. Uh, up here, sorry about this, folks. Up here, this was a minus... No. It's a plus 8x. Why did my screen just go? <laughs> just came back. Um, I've gotten lost because of all the mess here. Um, up here at the top, we had a minus 2 x squared times the x squared is minus uh, minus 2x times it. So minus 2x squared. Plus
I think that's supposed to be a plus. Uh, that's supposed to be an 8x. I messed it up. Um, I was switching terms and stuff and got lost in the sauce. Minus 2x times x squared is minus, I put a minus out front, minus 2x squared, okay? And then we had a plus 8x, um, but I pulled the minus 2 out, so that leaves a minus 8x. So yeah, that 8x and this one, uh, those disappear too. So that's why it wound up being 8x over 2 x minus 2 cubed. I messed up there. Okay. Plus 8. Okay. Now, here's our second derivative set. 8 over x minus 2 cubed. That cube should have a line for us. Right, if I try to erase the line. Let me see if I can. I can erase all the... No, oh, I can't either if I don't get the eraser to work. Okay. I don't need that. I don't need that. And I don't need... Well, I erased too many lines. Okay. So there's my second derivative. 8 over x minus 2 cubed. All right. There's no place for that zero. The numerator is 8. It's not to ever be 0. Okay? Certainly it doesn't exist at x equal 2, but x equal 2 isn't in your domain. So that's out. So there's no points of inflection. Okay? There's two critical values. Here's one, there's the other. No points of inflection. Now, let's think about this for a moment, though. What we have is two regions. Uh, the domain is x less than 2 and x greater than 2. When x is less than 2, so when this is a number less than 2, this thing is negative, right? A negative number cubed. So our second derivative is, is negative, meaning concave down when you're less than 2. If x is greater than 2, then this thing is positive, so it's concave up when it's uh, any value greater than 2. So it does give you your concavity, but it just doesn't give you a, a, a uh, point of inflection. What would have been a point of inflection is where it doesn't exist anyway. So now we've got enough information, but just no room to write it. So let me do the same thing I did before and erase everything but the crucial pieces. I want to say critical pieces, but you can't say that. So I don't need our scientific, I mean our synthetic division anymore, so that's out. We did need our slant asymptote, so we've got that, so let me leave that in there. Okay, I don't think we need this form anymore, so I'll get rid of it. I don't need these ugly calculations here where I made my error but found it later. We don't need that anymore. Or this. We do need our second derivative, so I'm going to leave that in here and rewrite it as our second derivative. Okay. Those are all and the first derivative, we've got what we needed to our critical value, so I think we can eliminate all this. I hope I'm not erasing too much, but if I am, y'all got it in your notes. I know that. Okay. Oh, we're almost out of time. But I think we can finish the problem now that if I can get all this erased so we can draw our graph. Okay. Now. Let's 
plot in what we need. This is our f double prime of x. Okay. I don't think we'll need it, but I wanted to leave it in there. Okay. So they tick off a few points. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Positive 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Negative 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. Got it. Not much to go on here. We have a vertical asymptote at x equal 2. So let's dot that in. Oh, it didn't pick up red. There we go. There's our vertical asymptote. No horizontal asymptote. No x-intercept. We do have a y-intercept, so let's put that in there. That's at 0, negative 2. That's down here. That's also a critical point. We have another critical point at 4, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We barely got that one in there, didn't we? Right about up here. Okay, get out of there. Okay, there we have another critical point at 4, 6, or somewhere close to that. All right, that's all we got, folks. Oh, we have our horizontal, I mean, our slant asymptote, which let me go on and put this back in here in red again, at y is equal to x. And some, for some reason... I know why I lost it there, but for some reason, I lost my critical point up there. Nope, that's not what I wanted to do. It's at 4, 6. Right about there. Now, we do have enough information. We know we have a a uh, critical point at 0, negative 2 right there, and we also know that the function is concave down there. So it's going to the slant asymptote in this direction and the vertical asymptote in that direction with a slope here of 0. Yes, we know that. Up here, we know this is a minimum because our second derivative is positive up here, so it's going to our slant asymptote in that direction and our vertical asymptote there with a slope of zero there. There it is. Not well drawn, but you got it. And sure enough, no horizontal asymptote. There is a slant asymptote, but there's no x-intercept because it never touches. It's down here or up there never touches the x-axis. So sure enough, that's how it looks. Now let's see how the books look. And I'll hold it up here so it just doesn't show. And you see, we got it. We did everything. They didn't show the slant asymptote. That would have been helpful. But there's your minimum at 4.6, your maximum at 0, negative 2. It just, I didn't label that. I should have. Uh, maximum here, minimum there because of your second derivative. Goodness gracious, insanity. All right. So there was example two. I don't think we're going to have time for example three, so that's where we'll start next time. Uh, so let me do some erasing here. Okay. We'll begin right there with example three. Let's see. Homework exercises here. Oh, yeah. We came close to finishing three six. Uh, I think you can do all of the uh, all of them five through eight. Only five and seven are in the back of the book and at Calc Chat, but I think you can match those uh, uh, functions in the A, B, C, D to the first derivatives in uh, five, six, seven, and eight. But the answers are only good for five and seven at Calc Chat and in the back of the book. And then you can do any of the odds 9 through 35. They're all at Calc Chat. 33 is at Calc View. And you can do, let's stop there, okay? Because the rest of them get into the trig stuff, so we'll come back and do those later. In fact, let me back off and say just do 9 through 23. 
We'll come back and do 25 too. 9 through 23, they're all at top chat. Good deal. Any questions? Good deal. Thanks for hanging with us the whole time. Uh, and we will pick up and do from there next time. Any questions? Can't find my cursor. There it is. Somewhere. It's jumping all over the place. <laughs>